most of the fires that we go through are of our own doing. And, uh, but he said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Take your Bible, look with me to the book of Hebrews for a minute. We're going to skip over the latter part of chapter 2. I do it very purposefully. I preached on it in January of uh, 2018. And uh, I thought, well, that's just a year ago. And I'm sure you all remember the outline and the illustrations. And I didn't feel like that I could preach that one again. <clears throat> and you'd recognize it. Uh, so we're going to get into chapter 2 today. I really, really feel led. Uh, this is where God would have us to be. Uh, last Sunday, I thought that the Lord Jesus is God's final offer. He's not going to present another avenue by which we can know him other than the Lord Jesus Christ. The latter part of chapter 2 uh, is not only is God better than the prophets, God's better than the angels. And um, today we're, we're going to be looking... Uh, at um, a neglected salvation, a neglected salvation. The writer kind of shifts gears in chapter number two and he goes from proclamation to application. You know, a lot of preachers get really off balance to, when they're preaching. Uh, there'll be a lot of proclamation and a lot of uh, exegesis, but kind of weak on application or they give a whole bunch of application and not much exegesis. But this writer has a great balance in, in, in that. And he's shifting those gears to us. And he's bringing to the table with us this morning the first of five warnings in the book of Hebrews. The first of five warnings. Now, last Sunday, I talked to you about uh, really the purpose of the book of Hebrews is found in chapter 13 that it is a book of encouragement, and there's no doubt about that. And, and so he's giving us today a word of encouragement, but it's also a word of warning. The second warning is going to come in chapter 3. The fourth, uh, excuse me, the third warning is going to come in chapter 4. The fourth warning is going to come in chapter 5. And the fifth warning is going to come in chapter 6. So you just kind of hang on. We're going to be dealing with them about every other week or so uh, as we travel our journey through the book of Hebrews. So pick it up with me now, beginning in verse number one, number 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip or drift for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast in every sin of commission and every sin of omission received a just recompense of reward or received a judgment, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with different kinds of miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Now, let's think a minute about chapter 2. He says, take heed now, because I don't want you uh, to drift, or I don't want you to slip. Uh, would, <laughs> does anybody in here know what it means to drift or to slip spiritually? I dare say every one of us in this room could kind of stand and give testimony that, uh, man, I, 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 before I knew it, I had slipped away. Before I knew it, I had uh, drifted uh, away. We, we got a lot of drifters that come. Most churches do, but especially the high-profile churches that are geographically located near a, a, a kind of a, a busy thoroughfare like we are. They'll come by and they'll have their hand out and you ask him, well, where, where are you going and what you doing? Well, I'm, I'm just drifting. Well, we just tell them, well, you just drift on down somewhere else and, and, and somebody else will take care of you. And you know what? Somebody else will. Uh, but they're just drifting with no purpose, no uh, meaning, uh, no aim in their life and just feel like that, you know, we, we can just get handouts from time to time and don't have to work for it. I, I remember putting up a family. They came here one time and... Um, I, I just fell for the whole spiel 
and uh, found them a house to live in, got them furniture, uh, paid their deposits on the utilities, and lo and behold, instead of going to work like he said he was doing, they were going to the swimming pool down in Charlotte and spending all day long. Just drifters, drifters. And yet that's what the word of God is saying right here in verse number one. Now watch what he says. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard lest at any time we should let them slip. Now understand that during the time of this writing they didn't have the Bible like you and I have. Uh, it was transmitted orally. The gospel was transmitted from mouth to ear. And so he's saying, uh, be careful that you pay attention, that you watch out, that you take seriously the things that you have heard. Now, if we were going to put it down today, because we have the word of God, we would say pay attention and take seriously not only the things which you have heard, but also that which you have read lest you find yourself drifting so that we don't slip away, that we don't fall by the wayside, that we, 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 we have the inertia that sometimes has a tendency to pull us away from that which is pure and right and holy and good and true. So he says, be careful. You, you know, I've, I've noticed, and, and most pastors do, uh, I, I have, I've noticed that people who have veered, people who have slipped, people who have drifted away had absolutely no intentions of ever doing it when they slipped away. Heard about an old boy, he had a, a head full of hair. I mean, he had a bunch of hair, kind of like Lang, La, Landon down here on the front row. He just had all kinds of hair about him. And he, he, he just loved his hair. And he noticed that he, he started over a period of time, his hair started to recede. And, and it just kept falling out and kept going away. And he kept getting more and more uh, or less and less hair about him. And in about four years, the only hair he had was one little old strand of hair right there in the middle, about four inches long. That old boy, every morning, he'd get up and he'd wash that hair and shampoo it. <laughs> he'd blow dry and comb it. One morning he woke up and he looked over and there was that strand of hair lying on his pillow. He saw that hair and he woke his wife up. Honey, honey, wake up, I've gone bald. He was already bald, but he, he lost that one last hair. Do you, do you know that there are people that just kind of wake up one day and they discover, you know, I'm out of fellowship. I, I don't want to pray anymore. I don't want to read my Bible. I don't want to go to church. Uh, I, I don't want to give. You, you understand that that didn't just happen overnight. It happened as a result of a series of things that took place that led up to that discovery of drifting, drifting, and drifting. I also think when I read this, uh, this verse that I think about lost people. I think about the unsaved people that come to the house of God or maybe somebody has talked to them and witnessed to them about salvation and they hear the gospel and, and they say, you know what? I know that I need Jesus. I, I know that I need to repent of my sins. I, I know I need to get right with God. I know that I need to turn away from this lifestyle and I, I do want to go to heaven when I die and, and I know that this is the right thing to do but, but I'm still a young person. I still got plenty of time left. Uh, I, I intend to do this, but not just right now. And so they say no, and they drift away a little bit. And, and, and the message comes back, yeah, I know I need to do that. And they drift a little bit further. And they keep hearing and rejecting. You, you understand, uh, there, there's a whole lot of difference right here in neglecting the scriptures. That's what he's talking about here. And rejecting the scriptures. 
years. And they keep rejecting and rejecting and they cross over that line of demarcation that they can never get back over ever again. How tragic that that is. I read very interestingly this week about a uh, hundred years ago uh, on the Niagara River. Uh, there was a tugboat that was pulling a barge that was uh, carrying a bunch of sand and rocks that had two sailors on board that barge. A and they were navigating uh, down the Niagara River and the tugboat uh, hit a sandbar somewhere along that river and jolted it where it could not uh, move anymore. And as soon as it hit that sandbar, that steel line that connected the tugboat with the barge snapped like a twig and the barge got completely out of control as it was drifting down the Niagara River at a rapid speed and headed toward the falls. It was only about a mile away. And the sailors on board as that out of control barge was moving down the river, cried out, somebody help us, somebody help us. They knew that if something miraculous didn't take place, uh, they were doomed to go over the falls. Well, the unexpected took place about a quarter of a mile from the edge of the falls when that barge struck a huge rock in the middle of the rapids and brought it to a dead stop. Those sailors the next day were rescued off of that barge. The barge is still there even to this day a hundred years later. Uh, it's amazing what a, what a graphic picture that that is of those that are without Christ that are drifting toward the ultimate destination over the falls. But we as God's children, we have a rock in the middle of the river that anchors us that those who know him are secure, but those that don't know him are going to be plunged over the falls. Drifting is like breathing carbon monoxide. You breathe it and you breathe it and unbeknownst to you, you're breathing this uh, odorless and tasteless uh, uh, gas that's there. And, and before you know it, you have breathed in way too much and by the time that you realize it, it is way too late. We, we drift from salvation. We drift from the assurance of salvation. We drift from bearing fruit as God's children. We drift from having a vibrant and alive and an effective testimony for the glory of Christ. He says, be careful. Watch out. Don't slip. Don't drift. The second thing I want you to see with me today is the disobedience to salvation. The disobedience to salvation. Watch verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience, and he's talking very clearly here about the sin of commission. You're doing things that you know that you ought not to do. And then he uses the term disobedience and, and that's referring to those sins uh, that you don't do, that you know that you ought to do. The, the obedience that's there. Received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? And, and, he, and what he's talking about in verse two is this whole area of disobedience, this whole lifestyle of disobedience to what we have heard and what we have read and we begin to ignore it or we begin to neglect it. Now there are two ways that you can respond when you get caught from running a stop sign. You, you can say, well, I disobeyed the law. But in reality, what took place is, is that you ignored the law. Now, now, what the writer does, he does something so subtle here, but it's so powerful. It was a way of getting across the point that he's trying to make. He is arguing from the lesser to the greater. He says, if this is true from this vantage point, it's certainly even more true 
from this vantage point or from this particular area. And, and what he's saying here is that you can ignore all of the commands that keep you in fellowship and communion, but the end product is going to be a life that has drifted. And if that's the end product, you've got to understand, if God did what he did under the law, if God punished those who were disobedient under the law, how much more is he going to punish those who disobey, who walk away, who drift, who slip while under the grace when we have ignored the greater message that has come to us. Now, I found out something in my study for today. Uh, I, I, I really, a uh, couple of things that I want to share with you about it. If you go under the Ten Commandments and you just study the Ten Commandments and look at it, if we, you and I had enough time, I could show you scripturally that if you broke any one of the Ten Commandments, capital punishment could be the end result of your disobedience. In other words, if you disobey and dishonor your mama and your daddy, under the law, they could take you out and kill you. I reminded my kids of that about every day that they were growing up in my house. <laughs> Lying was punishable by death. Adultery was punished by, punished by death. Taking the name of God in vain was punishable by death. You say, well, praise God. I'm glad I don't live under the law anymore, but, well, well me too. But the fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, we have made soft that which God made hard, and we have made light that which God has made heavy. And, and, and let me just tell you what verse 2 is saying. If God didn't put up with any junk, from those people that were living under the law, how much more is he not going to put up with the junk of those of us who are living on this side of Calvary? He, he, he very plainly says it, and he says, okay, if God took care of them, disciplined them, if God brought judgment and wrath upon them, how shall we escape? Now, he's not talking about losing our salvation here. That's not the point of this message, not the point of verse number three. But he is talking about evoking the judgment and the wrath of God. I, I love what he says here. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? You know, salvation is great. God initiated salvation. God carried out Salvation. God made it possible for every one of us in this room to know him and to come into a right relationship with him. God ensured that the blood of his son would cover our sin and to cleanse us of all of our sin. God is providing a great salvation in the fact that he has assured us that nothing in life or death will ever be able to take that away from us. It's a great salvation because of its effect because one of these days, God's gonna take us to heaven when he's done with us here on this earth. It's a great salvation. We don't get excited about it though, do we? Maybe a half a dozen in here got excited a few minutes ago. We're just not as excited about God's salvation as we ought to be. But I want to say something to you. Neglecting something like this is extremely dangerous. And you don't break God's laws without impunity. You just don't. You don't go down here to the Bank of America building, get up on top of the building and think, you know what, I don't weigh but about 150 pounds and, and, and I'm just going to, I think I can jump and, and if I, I just land on my feet down there, that I'm going to be all right and everything's going to be fine. I just believe that I can do that. As a matter of fact, I, I probably just kind of float like a feather going on down there. Well, you jump off that building and you discover 
when you hit the ground that it's not what you thought it was going to be. Well, don't lift up your voice to God and say, oh, God, you don't love me. You didn't take care of me. Well, God's not going to violate the natural laws that he's already. Don't blame God for your stupidity when you break the natural laws of God. That applies to the, to the moral laws that he set in place as well. You don't break God's moral laws without impunity. Uh, you, you, you think with me for, for just a, a few minutes about God's law of sex. Sex is a wonderful, beautiful gift that God has given to us to enjoy in the confines and the boundaries by which he has gifted it to us. He created Adam and he created Eve. And he said in the confines of a husband and a wife that that gift of sex is to be enjoyed and they too shall become one flesh. And when you break God's moral law, you can expect that there are going to be some severe consequences. Now, folks, listen. If you're watching by television today and you're here in this audience, don't get mad at me about this. This is just what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible says. And when you take the Bible away as your supreme authority for living, you're in major trouble. I got one of those sweet little emails yesterday that I get from time to time. And they, they call me several names, bigoted and all kinds of things like that. And you may call me an old fuddy-duddy. Well, that's all right. You, you may say that I'm intolerant as they did. No, it's not that I'm an old fuddy-duddy. It's not that I'm intolerant. It's just what God's word says. And if you break that, if you violate that moral law that God's put in place, expect the consequences. Now, what are the consequences? Well, I'm glad you asked. Look, look at Romans with me for just a minute. And look at the first chapter. Romans chapter 1 and notice verse 27. Okay? God makes it clear and plain and unmistakable to us what breaking his moral law will do. Watch this in verse 27. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves, they broke the law, broke God's moral law. As a result, they received the judgment that comes as a result of their decisions. You say, well, preacher, do you believe that AIDS is the judgment of God um, when man breaks God's moral law? Absolutely. I sure do. I, I, I don't believe that would ever exist had that not occurred. What, what the word of God in Hebrews is telling us is don't drift. Don't slip. Don't go back. How does that happen? Well, I've seen it happen like a lot of other preachers do. You, you see people down front, man, they got their hands in the air. They're clapping and they're praising God. And they're having a hallelujah time every Sunday morning. And then all of a sudden you see them, they kind of slip back to the back a little bit and they don't praise God anymore. And, and, and they're not worshiping any longer. Before long, they're in the balcony. And right after that, they're out the back door. And their church attendance is just gone. And along with that, no longer do they open God's word and read it. No longer do they have any time to pray. And no longer do they show up at the house of God to worship. And no longer do they give. They have drifted. And pretty soon, God is not even a factor in their life. Christians begin to drift. They lose the excitement, the crispness, the joy of following Jesus. And as you pastor today, I pray that none of you will 
drift. But the beautiful part about it is, is that when we do, and we all do, when we drift, thank God he has given us the unique ability to turn back and to get right with him once again. They, David is the prime example. You, you understand, it didn't just start with David when he was on the rooftop and looked down at Bathsheba taking that bath. He had already started drifting. He had already made some crazy decisions that brought him to the place of alienation from the fellowship of God. But, but I see him in Psalm 51 when, when he's crying out to God and he says, oh God, I am a sinner. God restored to me the joy of my salvation and God did exactly that. And as best as I can tell in reading the word of God, no longer did David drift anymore after that. That's I'm just saying to you and encouraging you here today, God will let you come back to him. God will restore that joy. God will give you back that excitement. Let me give you the third thing. It's the dependability of our salvation. The dependability of our salvation. Notice again now verse three. How shall we escape if we neglect so great? It's not just a great salvation. It's a so great salvation. Kind of like the word you've read somewhere before. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a so great salvation that was first announced by the Lord himself over in Mark chapter one and verse 15 when he says the time has come and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. He came announcing the gospel. The Bible says he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He announced to the world that he was the central figure of salvation. And then he makes a remarkable statement here in verse three. And was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. So Jesus announces, I am salvation. I, I came here uh, to uh, present the gospel and I am the gospel. But then it was confirmed uh, by others as well, by them that heard him. In 2 Peter chapter 2, excuse me, 1 and verse 16, the Bible, Peter says, uh, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, Peter was saying, let me just tell you, this salvation that is in Christ is not hearsay. We're eyewitnesses that he did everything that he said that he was going to do. We saw him in his majesty. And then in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says we, have, we proclaim that which we have seen and that which we have heard. Salvation was announced by Jesus and it was confirmed and verified by eyewitnesses. But now watch this in verse 4. God also, bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with different kinds of miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Now, what does this mean? It means that this salvation was made credible by the announcement of the Lord himself, by the confirmation of eyewitnesses that they had seen and that they had heard. And then God comes on the scene and he produces these miracles and signs and wonders to verify and to confirm the gospel or salvation through Christ with signs and wonders and miracles. Now, now hear my heart a minute. Do you know what the important thing um, uh, about a sign is? And I know this and you know this too. You know a lot of people that they kind of live their lives based upon God give me a sign. I had, had a guy not long ago, uh, he was telling me about how I, I needed a sign from God. A lot, a lot of people live their lives according to signs. They, they get caught up in that. But you understand the value is not in the sign, but the value is in what the sign points to. Now y'all didn't get that. 
The value of the sign is not the sign, but what the sign points to. If you were coming uh, from east to west over here on Independence, you get right over here in front of Chick-fil-A and there's a sign on the road out there that says Metrolina Christian Academy. Well, now you wouldn't pull up to the sign off the side of the road and park by the sign and say, I'm here. <laughs> no. That, 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 the value of that green sign up there is what it is pointing to. Of course the Lord Jesus Christ touched the eyes of the blind and made them see. Of course he touched the lame and helped them to walk. Of course he healed the sick and he raised the dead. But all that was done according to scripture was to point to salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect, neglect so great salvation? Jesus announced it. Eyewitnesses confirmed it. God verified it through signs and wonders. I wonder how many people that are in here this morning that you once were addicted to some major drug and God set you free from it. How many alcoholics have been delivered from alcoholism? How many adulterers have been forgiven for that sin of adultery? How, how many people are in this room today that God forgave you of your past and he came into your heart and he set you free and miraculously changed and transformed your life? The warning here in this passage is simply, don't drift don't slip. Don't fall away. Don't yield to the inertia that would take you away from that which is true. You say, how do I do that? How do, how do I keep from drifting? You, you walk in the spirit. If you walk in the spirit, then you're not going to yield to the flesh. How do I walk in the spirit? You find you a time every day that you can get in a prayer closet somewhere and pray and seek God. Every day. You find a time every morning that you can get into the word of God, whether it's praying for five minutes or five hours or reading the scriptures, but it has to be on a daily basis. You cannot, you can't walk in the spirit if you don't spend time in prayer, if you don't spend time in the word of God. And then I'm probably talking to the choir at this point, but I'm going to tell you, you've got to stay in fellowship with other believers. I don't understand this new generation that think that they have a relationship with God and they can only show up at church once every four or five weeks. Uh, I promise you, if you neglect to come and find yourself faithful in the house of God, you're going to grow cold spiritually. We need that accountability. We need that uh, uh, relationship with others that can challenge us and encourage us and hold us accountable. If you don't, you're going to drift. Now, I, I don't know about you. I, I can only speak, I, I ought to, scripturally, what I'm about to tell you is true. If you're a child of God and you've been saved and delivered by the grace of God, you can't drift very far without the Holy Spirit of God pew, snatching you right back because whom he loves he disciplines and scourges all of us that belong to him. I'm telling you, I can't mess up but just a little bit and all of a sudden the spirit of God is yanking me back to God. That, that's proof positive that you belong to him. Now let me, let me say this. If, I don't mean to be mean, but if you can drift and drift and drift and you don't experience the discipline of God, you're in real trouble. You're like that barge on the Niagara River 
that's out of control, helpless to do anything about it. And if you don't come to Jesus, you're headed to the ultimate destination. You're going to go over the falls. You know, I come to church, don't bother me if I don't go. I don't, I don't ever feel guilty. I don't ever get any kind of chastisement from God if I don't pray and read my Bible. I don't have any difficulty by not giving my resources back to God. I, I think you're in trouble. You've got a whole lot more going on than what the scripture's talking about here. And you're in major eternal trouble. If you don't get to Jesus and be saved and you have no right to believe that you're saved if you can drift without the chastisement of God in your life and you need to be saved. So he says, don't drift. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.